Well, good morning, everybody. Great to see everybody here. My name is uh, Brian Mosley. I serve as the lead pastor. I almost forgot my name there for a second, but uh, yeah, I'm sliding into 40 tomorrow. So, um, whew, so that's why, um, you know, and, and I thought that I would just go ahead and put my uh, glasses on for you today uh, because I've been needing to for a while, but it seems like now since I'm uh, getting over the hill a little bit more... Um, I'll just go ahead and make that transition uh, here today. But anyway, so good to see you guys here. And um, we're going to dive into uh, four, part four. And really, uh, you're, gonna be, you're not going to let me live that down, are you? Uh, it's going to be part four and basically the wrap-up, the conclusion of the series that we've been calling Baggage. Okay, everybody say that with me, Baggage. baggage. All right, we've been, we've been talking about baggage and just how important it is to understand that God really does want us to live free. And he really does want us to travel light. Okay, we're going to dive into that in just a, just a couple minutes. But before we do, I want to tell you what's uh, coming up in the next few weeks. Next week, uh, as Pastor Rory shared, we're going to be doing water baptism. So I want you to sign up. If you, if, if you have placed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you have confessed him... And, and God has made you a new person in Christ, then you need to be water baptized. So go ahead and sign up on that connection card and let us know. Also next week, we're going to be celebrating communion. I love to celebrate the Lord's Supper. There's just something so powerful when, we're, when we take the time to remember what Jesus for us when he when his body was broken for us when his blood was shed for us so we're going to do that next week so I want to make sure that you know that uh, also next um, next in two weeks on September 9th Pastor Brent Lively who's been serving as our executive pastor is going to be preaching and he's going to be sharing a, a sermon that's called uh, pressing toward the mark okay if you know if you know Pastor Brent he is, a, he is a man of God, okay? And you're going to want to hear what he's sharing on that day. And in fact, I have some, some sad news that we need to talk about, just a little church business before we dive into the word. Pastor Brent has submitted his resignation, okay? Um, here, let me, tell you, let me tell you a little bit. He wrote us a letter, and I want to uh, just read that to you uh, from, from his words. He said, uh, Dear Springs Church, I wanted to let you know that I am resigning my position as executive pastor, effective September the 30th. Okay, September the 30th. Sharda and I believe that we have accomplished our assignment at the church. The merger with Deep Roots uh, Congregation was successful, and members are integrated and serving at the Springs. We have, we have 10 new life groups that have been successfully launched and set a strong foundation for future growth and community at the church. And he needs to seek uh, full-time employment opportunity in ministry. He said, I sincerely appreciate having had the opportunity to work with each of you and have enjoyed my time here at the Springs Church. And Pastor Adam Childress will be assuming my leadership of life groups starting on October the 1st, okay? So he said, thank you so much for your support and encouragement that you've provided to me and my family during our time at the Springs Church, and even though I will miss my fellow workers in ministry, I am looking forward to starting this new chapter of ministry leadership in my life. So what I want, what I want you to do, yeah, let's just praise God. <clears throat> The Livelies are out of town this weekend celebrating a birthday, uh, but what I want us to do is just flood them with lots of love, flood them with lots of support, and in fact, that fellowship event that we're going to do on September the 30th, we're going to make it about them. Let's just celebrate them, let's honor them, and let's thank God for them, and continue to pray for them as the Lord leads them into their next chapter in ministry. Amen? Amen. Okay. Um, next up. Uh, also, we have uh, the, that marriage seminar, and Mike Chapman, one of our overseers, and my pastor from Tennessee is going to be preaching on September the 16th. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, and then I'm going to talk. I'm going to share with you a series called "Own the Vision." Okay, I'm going to take some time just to talk to you, talk through with you the vision 
that God has given this church. And I'm going to ask you not only to hear it and to understand, but to own it. To make it yours. To buy in to what God wants to do in and through this church. The potential of our church is, is absolutely outrageous. But we've got to be in it together. And we've got to be unified in the mission and vision of our church. So I'm going to take time for a few weeks and really talk about that. And encourage and really challenge each of us to buy into that. So now, are you ready to get into baggage? Okay, so I am absolutely convinced, without a shadow of a doubt, that God wants his children to live free and to travel light. And it's been my prayer as we've progressed through the teachings of this series that you and I would experience liberation. That we would experience the, the liberating power of God in our lives. That we would experience the liberating power to let go of, of these things that we call baggage and bondages and heavy weights that weigh us down and slow us down and make us ineffective. But that we would experience God's power to set us free. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I love to travel. Any travelers in the room? Anybody love to travel? Okay. Any travel haters in the room? Okay. You just hate. Okay. There's a few. You just hate to travel. Okay. We love to travel as a family. We just, we just enjoy it. Always have. Love the adventure of it. So love, love most things about traveling. And uh, I've had the opportunity in my past life uh, to, not past life, but past job, I should say, uh, and as I worked as a pastor in Tennessee, uh, we, uh, I served as an outreach pastor, and I had a chance to travel the world, do, do some missions trips in Israel, and Romania, and Albania, and Chile, and different places around the world. And I just loved it, just to be able to go and experience new cultures and, and travel the airports. But the thing I hated was the baggage. You got to carry so much baggage around. You got to check into the airport. You got to get, get got to get all that stuff in taxis. Oh, oh, the 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 best part of traveling, in my opinion, is traveling with your family. Okay. Now, in our family, there's five of us and two dogs. Okay, and so you can imagine we have a minivan that we like to get in from time to time, and we just like to travel. Now, you can imagine the the uh, baggage. That goes into our van. I mean, there are times when we load up and head out, and I look in the rear view mirror, and, and I know there are people back there, but I cannot see them because the luggage, the baggage is like stacked so high, and it's just overwhelming. In fact, I took a picture of it. Look up, look up here. This is us, okay? <laughs> this is us. This is how we travel, Okay? And when, uh, when my grandparent, my mom and dad go with us, this is what it looks like, okay? Yeah. <clears throat> we do not travel light. We travel, we pack everything. We pack the kitchen sink. Any packers in the room, like you just pack everything, anything that you can possibly think of in your family, we're grateful that you thought of everything, right? Okay. The only thing I don't like about traveling is the baggage. And so today when it comes to our spiritual life, I want you to just think about the baggage that you may be carrying around in your life because God wants us to throw, throw off the baggage. He wants us to throw off the baggage to learn to live free and to travel light. And, it, and it's not that our destination is bad. I mean, we have a destination. It's fantastic. It's heaven. It's fulfilling our purpose. Our destination is set. And it's not that the journey is bad. No, the journey is wonderful. We enjoy the, the, the process of getting there every day. But it's just sometimes that we, that we pick up and we carry this accumulated baggage along the way, and it makes us weighed, weighted down. It weighs us down spiritually and emotionally, and, it's, and it sometimes causes us to lose our joy, and it steals any peace that we may have 
in this life. And so our key question that, we, that I want us to think about today is this. What are you carrying around that should not be part of the trip? What are you carrying around that should not be part of your trip? I want you to think about this today as we go into uh, Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to look at our theme verse. And it says, it says this. Go ahead and grab your message notes if you got those out in your worship guide or you can follow along on the screen. Um, but it says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, look at this next part. Let us throw off everything that hinders. Do you hear that? Do you hear that right there? Do you hear that, what to do with your baggage right there? It says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance. Perseverance means I'm just not going to give up. I'm going to keep going no matter what. I may feel like throwing in the towel, but I'm not going to throw in the towel because I know that I've got a race that I'm called to run. So he says, run that race with perseverance, fixing our eyes on Jesus. That means you're fixed on him. You're thinking about him. You are focused upon Jesus. And it says this, the, the pioneer or the author and the perfecter or the completer of our faith. What an awesome scripture. What an awesome encouragement that the writer of Hebrews gives to us. To keep pressing on and throw off all of these things that may weigh us down in our Christian walk. But today I want to talk about, I want to talk about something specific and, and it's this. We need to learn to demolish every spiritual stronghold that the enemy tries to put in our lives. I want you to think about this today, okay? I want you to think about strongholds. We need to learn to demolish every enemy stronghold in our life, and we want to stay free. The Bible says that the sun has set you free. If the sun has set you free, you are what? You are free indeed. And we need to make sure that we're living our lives in such a way that we stay free. We don't get bound up again by all of this baggage. Now, the biblical word for baggage is stronghold. Okay? Think, think about this. The biblical word for baggage is stronghold. And we see it where the Apostle Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He says this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, listen to this, they have divine power to do what? Demolish strongholds. Okay, we're going to talk about the weapons a little bit later, but what are the, what's the purpose of the weapons that God gives us? It is to demolish strongholds. Everybody say that with me. Demolish strongholds. Now, think about this. Spiritual strongholds are any attitudes... Philosophies, teachings, or mindsets that oppose the true knowledge of God. Okay? Let me, say it, let me say it this way. A stronghold is something that you believe, but it is actually a lie. Okay? And the only way to defeat a stronghold in your life is to change the way you think. Okay, change the way you think. The Greek word for stronghold is this. This is up on your screen, up on the screen, and in your notes. I'm probably going to butcher this uh, saying it in Greek, but it's okurama, okurama. It literally means this: a prisoner locked by deception. You're trapped. You're in a prison, and because you're in a prison because you have been deceived, and you are believing an untruth. You are believing a lie. It's living life by something that is not true. This is a, this is a stronghold. It becomes a part of your identity when you live with this stronghold for any amount of time. It becomes a part of your core. 
And when it does, you become increasingly hopeless. And it leads you even to despair. You know what? You also become defensive. When anybody mentions anything about this particular stronghold or anything that comes up in church or life group or in the Bible, you become defensive and you say, that's not me. I don't deal with that. This is, this is just the way that I, I am. This is, the, this is the way that I, I, this is my identity. And you actually become a slave to this stronghold. And, and because of that, you begin to lose your life. You begin to lose your enjoyment. You begin to lose your peace and your, and your sense of well-being and relationship with the Lord because you have been living your life by something that is not true. But the Apostle Paul in the Word of God says something powerful and he interrupts all this nonsense and he cuts to the chase and he says this in Romans chapter 6. Look at it with me. It says, Do not let sin control the way you live. Or in other words, do not let these strongholds, do not let these lies, do not let these false beliefs control the way you live your life. Do not give in to those sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Look at this word, instead. Everybody say instead. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. Whoa, what a solution. What a, what a good idea the Apostle Paul gives us there. Instead, don't live your life in, in sin and lose your life and become defensive and weighed down and anxious and worried about everything. But no, instead, give yourselves completely to God. And just as Pastor Rory was talking about early, that earlier, that doesn't mean we, we just love, love God and appreciate Him and do all the religious things. No, that means that we trust Him. It means that we know Him in an experiential way. That our knowing of Him goes beyond mental assent, but it goes into the way that we live our lives. No, we don't just know Him, we trust Him. And so he says, instead, give yourselves completely to God. Sin is no longer your master. All this baggage no longer has power over you. Sin has no more power over you. You are no longer a slave to sin and death. No, Jesus has set us free. He, says, he goes on to say, instead, you live under the freedom. Everybody say that, freedom. You live under the freedom of God's Grace, do you hear God's heart in this? He's saying, beloved children, my sons and my daughters, I want you to hear my heart because my heart for you is this, is that you really learn to live free and you really learn to live to, and to travel light. This is God's heart. This is what he wants for all of us. Can you hear, can you hear his love in that? Can you hear his passion for you? Because he wants you to fulfill your race. He's got a purpose for you, and he doesn't want you to be hindered. He doesn't want you to be stopped in mid-track. No, he wants you to keep going in your race, but he wants you to do it with freedom, and he wants you to do it without all the weight of sin and strongholds in your life. Amen? Do you hear that from the heart of God this morning? But, what, but, but to do that, listen, we have to follow what the Apostle Paul continues to tell us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at this. This is so important. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension. Pretension just means claims. Claims to be true. We demolish every argument and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every single thought to make it what? To make it obedient to who? Christ. To Christ. In other words, we think about what we think about. We don't just let our thoughts roam. Right? We think about what we think about and we take every thought, good, bad, ugly, warts and all, Every thought, and we submit it, and we make it obedient to Christ. You see, the devil tries to invade each of our lives. 
He works overtime to get into our lives, because, and he does that through the lies that he plants in our brains. You, if, you, if you don't take your thoughts captive, it will be a matter of time before the devil starts using those lies to create mental and emotional strongholds for the purpose of just keeping you in bondage. That's what the enemy would love to do, is just keep you in bondage, keep you ineffective, keep you weighted down and stressed out. Let me say it like this. If you, if you take your thoughts captive, then your thoughts cannot take you captive. Okay, think, think about the importance of, of this. Two of the most common, I've been doing ministry for a little while now, a few years, and uh, one, two of the most common and most destructive strongholds that I've seen working with people, having conversations, doing counseling with people is this. Jot this down if you're taking notes with me. It's not an official blank, but it's just an extra, okay? But a common stronghold, number one, is this, an in, incorrect perception of who God is. An incorrect perception of who God is. This is the stronghold where a person sees God just wrong, incorrectly. They see him maybe as a cruel and as a distant, as an unloving God instead of the loving, gracious, heavenly father that he is. Some of the most common symptoms of, 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 of this kind of stronghold is this. There's a, there's a lacking of a desire for an intimate and close relationship with God. And feeling that just God is distant and cold and uninterested rather than intimate and loving and personal. Irrational fears of God that will hinder a person from, from drawing no closer to him. They have an irrational and, and unhealthy fear of him that prevents them from drawing closer to God. And I thought about this one even more. And, and there's a lack of love in this person's heart for God. And the reason that, that the world doesn't care about God is because they don't really know God. They don't perceive him correctly. And if you find it hard or boring to spend time with God and you would rather be doing other things, then you might have an incorrect perception of who God is. And that may be a stronghold that needs to come down in your life. Feeling unwanted or unloved by God. Many admit to this feeling that, that God is just mad at them. And I just want to tell you the truth this morning. God is not mad at you. He is madly in love with you. If a person wonders if God still loves them, it's a good clue that they may have a mis, misconception about who God really is. And a person with this kind of a stronghold, they, they can find it hard to trust God. They may enjoy all the Christian stuff that, that we do, but they find it hard to trust. And they may wonder, is God really faithful? Is God really going to do what he said he would do in his word? Is he really going to fulfill the promises that he has made in my life? And we start to believe those things because we have an incorrect perception of who God is. You see, our perception from who, for who God is needs to come from here. Right. right? Not from our experience, not from movies, not from Hollywood, not from this or that, but it needs to come from the truth that is revealed in this holy book. Right. <clears throat> Number two uh, common stronghold is this, an incorrect perception of yourself. Now think, think about this. When a person has this kind of stronghold, they feel uh, often unworthy or guilty or dirty. And they often suffer from low self-esteem. And low self-esteem is, is where a person is always kind of looking down upon themselves, very critical of themselves. But let me ask you, how can a creature who is handmade by the creator himself look down all the time upon himself? They fail to realize the truth that says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am created in his likeness. I am created in his image. 
And strongholds play a very important, uh, a big part in a person's struggle against feelings of low self-esteem. Also, a guilty conscience is usually found when a person who doesn't perceive themselves as a new creation in Christ. They haven't realized that they actually have forgiven. They actually have been made washed clean by the blood of Jesus. They don't believe that, and there's this feeling of guilty conscience going on. And usually a feeling of, of condemnation, usually a feeling of worthlessness, fears of hopelessness are usually strong signs of this particular stronghold going on in somebody's life. Now, again, I want to read one more time the verse in 2 Corinthians because I really want you to grasp the power of what the apostle is saying right here. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You want to learn to live free and travel light? Make this your application scripture. Okay? Take your thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. And remember, a stronghold is something that you believe that is actually a lie. And the only way that you can defeat it is to change the way you think. Okay? I want you to see how, just how important your mind is. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says this, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. And it goes on to say, because you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, you're going to be able to, to um, prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. You'll never find the will of God for your life until you align your thinking to his word. Okay? And then next scripture is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. It says this, you were taught to put off your old self. When you became a Christian, when you became born again, you got baptized. You were taught to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. And look, you are to be made new in the attitude of your, your minds. Do you know your minds got an attitude? Yeah. All right. Some of our minds got an attitude problem. Need to be straightened out, all right? <laughs> to be made new in the attitudes of your mind. Your thinking is important. If you really want to learn how to live free in Christ, you really want to lear learn to fulfill the will of God in your life, you have to align your thinking with the truth of God's word. No more lies. So would you say that with me? No more lies. Lies. I want you to just re resolve that in your heart today. No more lies. We want to experience freedom. We want to experience life without the baggage. One of my favorite scriptures is in John chapter 8, verse 32. Would you look at it with me? Jesus said this, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And we've got to learn that as God's children, we have to recognize that the devil's lies, we have to reject those lies and replace them with the truth of God's word. Then and only then can we live the life that we're called to live. How do you do that? How? Okay, Brian, I, I agree with everything that you said about strongholds, and I believe that it weighs us down, it causes us problems, it, it uh, makes us ineffective in our call, but how, how do we live that out, okay? I want you to think about this, because uh, how do we combat the lies of the devil, especially the ones we've been believing for years? Those are the hardest ones, but here's, here's, my, here's my theory 
on life, and I think it's very biblical, it's, and it's this. It's, always, it's easier to replace than to remove. Okay, th- just think about that with me. It's easier to replace than to remove. And, and to be honest with you, I believe that in just about a lot, in every area of life. I mean, think about it. It's easier to replace a bad habit than just to remove a, ha- a, b- a bad habit completely. Okay? Think about it. It's easier to replace fattening foods than to remove them completely from my diet. It's a whole lot easier to replace a bad relationship with a good relationship than just to go cold turkey and just have no relationship at all. So think about this. Don't, don't try to remove the lie. Replace it. Replace it with the truth of God's word. One of the most powerful practices that um, my wife and I do from time to time is that we, we each journal and we take some time to just check ourselves, check our inventory, and we ask ourselves, you know, are there any lies that we've been believing? And it's important to take the time out to, to ask yourself that, and we, and we just write them down. What are the lies we've been believing? Okay? I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. Um, I smell bad. No, that one may be true. Okay? Um, you know, what are, what are the lies that we've been believing? Okay? No, we're, we're experience prosperity. We're always going to stress. Uh, what are what are the lies that you believe? No, my marriage is never going to work. I'm not going to I'm not going to be successful in my business. What what are the lies that you believe? I'm never going to be good enough. I'm not going to measure up. I'm not going to have the kind of life that that I believe God wants me to have. My kids are never going to be saved. My husband's never going to come to the Lord. I'm never going to fulfill the call of God. I don't even know that there, there is a purpose that I have in life. What are the lies? You're good for nothing. You're, why are you here? Why do you exist? And what you do is you take those lies once you've identified them and you replace them with the truth of God's word. So it's no longer lies. No, it is now. No, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. No, I am God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he has prepared ahead of time that I should walk in them. No, a generous person will prosper. <clears throat> and you replace those lies with the truth of God's word. And when you begin to do that, you begin to see that this, these baggages, these strongholds are demolished and they're broken down and you begin to live in freedom that you didn't even know that you could live in. It's called demolishing strongholds. Everybody say that again with me. Demolishing strongholds. You guys remember the movie uh, Braveheart? Uh, who was the actor in that? Is it Mel, Mel Gibson? Um, that's one of my one of my favorite movies. Uh, I just love the feeling and the passion and the emotion in that movie. But you, there's one pivotal scene where William Wallace in that movie, he's, he's about to be executed, and the executioner asks him if he has any final, you know, final words before his death. And through his pain, William Wallace uh, utters this gut-wrenching cry. You remember what he said? He said, freedom, freedom. In his last breath, he utters this rallying call to the Scottish people as a reminder of the freedom that they so desperately lived, fought, and died for. It's a powerful moment. And it makes me think of of this, that I believe that Jesus' passionate cry over his church is the same. When Jesus looks at his bride, when he looks at his church, his sons and daughters, he is crying freedom. He wants us to live in his freedom. He wants us to enjoy our lives. He wants us to know our purpose. He wants us to know his father. 
and to know him intimately, not just going through the steps of religion. No, he wants us to know God and to find freedom, to discover our purpose, to make a difference. In fact, that's the whole mission and vision of our church. But why is that our mission and vision of our church? It's because it's the heart of our Father. It's our heart of our Father for you. It's the heart and it's the cry of Jesus for all of us. It's that cry, freedom, freedom, freedom. And in our hearts, we, have the, we, we, we need to have this resolve that we will no longer accept enemy strongholds. We will no longer live as slaves and we will no longer live bound up with no freedom and no weight in our lives. Do you hear the cry of Jesus today crying passionately freedom over your life? Not only over your life, but over your loved ones, your family, your friends, your co-workers, the people who you know and are close to. He is crying freedom over each person on this earth. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It says this, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Man, what a powerful verse. It is for that freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from bondage. Freedom from, uh, freedom from fear. Freedom from all the things that would entangle us and weigh us down. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So how do we do it? How do we break free and discover the life that God has for each of us? How do we maintain our freedom? How do we stay free? Let me give you three really practical thoughts, okay? Number one is this, can the excuses. Get rid of them. Can them. <laughs> Jesus told the parable of the Great Supper. In uh, Luke chapter 14, and he said there was a certain man who gave a great supper and invited many. Think about this. That he invited many into this great celebration. It was like, it's like he's inviting us all into the kingdom of God. He's inviting us all into an invitation to true freedom and true liberty. An invitation to really live free and travel light. And what did m most of the people do? In response to this invitation, look at it in Luke chapter 14, verse 18 and through 20. It says, but they all alike began to make. They all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. The another one said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another one said, I, I just got married, so I can't come. I got a honeymoon to enjoy. Please excuse me. Excuses, excuses, excuses to this great invitation. Number one, let me shoot it to you straight. Can the excuses... If you want to really live free, you want to travel light, get rid of them. Don't accept them anymore. Number two is this, cut the ties. Can the excuses cut the ties? Sometimes we just have to remember that any alignment, any agreement with the lies of the enemy must be cut out. Cut out completely. And sometimes it will require a radical decision to eliminate something, a radical decision to eliminate a connection or something that is dragging you down. It may require a very tough decision, something that other people will be like, wow, why, how did you, why in the world would you make a decision like that? It's because you're serious about living in freedom. Sometimes God will call us to do something that's tough and we must cut the ties. Sometimes it's a relationship. Sometimes it's a sinful, sinful beliefs and practices. 
Sometimes it's that, it, it is that relationship sometimes that is harmful, that just needs to be severed. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and, and do what? Stop sinning. Sometimes we just got to can the excuses. Sometimes we just got to uh, cut the ties. And number three, this is what I would tell you. This, okay? Fill the void. The boy, there will be a void sometimes when we have to cut the decisions. We have to get things out. We have to ex- take responsibility for our own lives, our own attitudes, our own words. We take responsibility for ourselves. And we have to fill the void. Number three, write that down if you're taking notes. If you're not taking notes, write that down. Uh, number three, fill the void. What do, we, what do we fill it with? Okay, that's the question. What do we fill the void with once we can the excuses and cut the ties? Number one is this. We fill it with God's spirit. Where we open up our hearts and we say, come Holy Spirit. Fill my heart. I am dry and empty and I need you. Fill me with the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. Look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. It says, don't get drunk on wine. In other words, don't do all these worldly things thinking that you're going to find enjoyment with them. Don't do all of these things that you falsely think will bring life to you. No, he says this, but instead be filled with what? The Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. I don't know if you've experienced the infilling of the Spirit before, but there is nothing better. It is glorious. And every day you can be filled and refilled and filled and refilled and just say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in my life. I want all that you have for me. I want to live in freedom. I want to live without bondage. I want to live really fulfilling the purpose that you have for me. I cannot do it alone, and I've got to fill this void, and I cannot accomplish this on my own. I can only accomplish it with your power and with your help. So open your heart to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Number two is this, God's Word. I don't know if you know this, but this book is not an ordinary book. It is holy. It is alive. It is powerful. It is sharp. It is working. It is God's breath. The word of God, it says that every word in here is inspired by God himself. So when you spend time in this word, you are feeding your soul. You are feeding your spirit. Do not neglect time in this word. If if it's on a shelf for a while, if it's been collecting dust, get it off. It's time to fill that void that you may be having in your life with the powerful Word of God. Look at what it says in um, <clears throat> Ephesians 5. It says we were washed by the cleansing of God's Word. Get in the Word. Listen to the word, read the word, memorize the word, meditate on the word. Let the word of God fill your heart. Amen. Amen. The next thing is this prayer. What is prayer? It is communion with God, it is conversation with your creator. One time uh, somebody told me that prayer is not so much something that you do, but it's someone that you're with. Prayer is spending time with the one who loves you the most. Prayer should be the highlight of of your day. Even if you only get five or ten minutes at some point in your day, it should be the most wonderful, glorious, non-boring five minutes of your day. Fill that void with prayer life. Let God challenge you and grow you and teach you how to pray and fill that up with with your life. Prayer. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 4. Jesus understands our weaknesses. 
Aren't we so grateful for that? Yeah, we're just humans. We are weak. We are frail. We are fragile. He understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same temptations that we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly. Look, this is prayer. Let us come boldly to our gracious God. And there we will receive his mercy and his grace to help us when we need it. My friends, there is power in prayer. Become a man or a woman of prayer. Study prayer. Hang out with people who know how to pray. The, the Bible says you want to be wise, then you rub elbows with, with wise people, right? Get around people who know how to pray. Spend time with them. Pray together. Ask people to pray for you. Offer to pray for other people. There is power in prayer. The next thing is this, an accountability partner. You want to really learn to fill that void and you want to make it stick? You want to have some, some freedom that lasts? You want to maintain that freedom that Jesus has given to you? You better be connected. You better be connected with somebody who can hold you accountable and who can ask you, how are you doing? And somebody who can look at you and look, look in your eyes and say, I know you're not okay. You want to talk about it. Can we go get some coffee? Can we go get some lunch? You need somebody to be in your corner cheering you on, but also holding you accountable. Look at what it says in James chapter 5, verse 16. It says, therefore, con confess your sins to Man, that can be a scary thing, especially in a church, but it shouldn't be, right? We should be the most honest, vulnerable, transparent, non-judgmental people on the face of the earth. And that's what I'm praying that each of us will be, so that we can truly live out this verse and say, therefore, confess your sins to each other and really pray for each other so that you might be, what? You might be healed. You need an accountability partner. You need somebody walking this Christian life with you. Somebody that you can call in the middle of the night and say, I'm going through this. Can you help me? I'm going through an emergency. You need people in your life who you can trust, who, you, who will hold you accountable. And the last thing is this. I would, I would say to you, if you really want to learn to fill this void, you really want to learn to live free and travel light, do some ministry. Get your mind off of yourself for like five minutes and do something that helps somebody else. <laughs> do some ministry. Get involved at your church. Hello, there's lots of serving opportunities around here. You see them? You see them on the back of this worship guide every single week. There are places where you can serve, where God can use your gifts your time, your, your talents, and you can get your mind off of yourself for just a few minutes and go make a difference in the lives of somebody else. Yeah. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, verse 21. And I want to go ahead and invite the worship team back up. Romans chapter 12, verse 21 says, Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Right? I'm going to get involved in something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some action to my faith. I'm going to put myself aside for just a little while, and I'm going to serve somebody else. That's how we fill the void. And I just want to encourage you today, if you'll make a decision today, to can some excuses, cut some ties, and let God just fill the void with his word, with his spirit, with an accountability partner, with prayer, with ministry. You will begin to shed some of this baggage that you've been carrying around for far too long. And you'll really learn that you can experience freedom. In Christ, and you'll really learn the heart of Jesus that says, I want you to live free, and I want you to learn to travel light. 
Would you stand with me, please? Let's just enter into a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your scriptures. We thank you, Lord, that they bring life to us. That your word ministers to us right where we are. We thank you, Lord, that you love us exactly where we are. speak to our to our hearts you would lord let us know any area of our life that we need to hand over to you that we need to submit to you we pray lord that you would give us the strength to obey you in everything to know you find freedom in you, to discover our God-given purpose, to make a difference in other people's lives. And church, if you're here today and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. One of our prayers, one of our constant prayers of our church and our leaders and our pastors is that God would bring people into our fellowship that need to know God, that need to experience salvation. And maybe you're here today and you're in that place and God is just speaking to you and today is your day. I just want to encourage you, don't procrastinate, don't put it off, and don't make those excuses. Say yes to God. Your life will never again be the same. You'll experience his freedom, his renewal, his passion. You'll experience everything that God wants you to have. And it is a beginning. It's a great beginning. It's not the end of your spiritual journey. It's the beginning of your journey. So if you're here today and you'd say like, Brian, I'm here because God has brought me here and he is calling me home. He is calling me to receive his salvation. If that's you, I just want to invite you to pray this prayer after me. I want to invite everybody to pray it. Just say this, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today a sinner. I am broken and in need of you. Today I confess my sins. I repent of all my sins. And I return to you. I believe, God, that you sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay for my sin. I believe that he rose on the third day. And today I put my full faith in him. Today I am born again. Today I am a son or daughter of the king. Today I have a home in heaven. Today, my name has been written in the Lamb's book of life, and I am your child. Now, please fill me now with your spirit. Make me a person of prayer. Make me a person of your word, and I will praise you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.